So good afternoon. It's Sunday afternoon here. Very cold and wet outdoors. Not a great day. And this isn't from today when walking Dora. It's from a couple of days ago. We were um, a favorite spot where we like to walk. It's all called Plumbing Park after Sir Sanford Plumbing. But there's Frog Pond, which is where the squirrels generally are. And then you can go down across a little road and into uh, the Dingle, where it's down along the northwest arm. And there's a path joining the two. And this is where we happen to be. And uh, there's one of the squirrels that makes Dora's day by going for a walk. So let's get going today. So our last test is coming up on Friday. Uh, should be better than previous ones. At least that's been the case in the past. It'll cover probability and uh, stuff we did last week. There's probably more, instead of it being half and half on chapters nine and 10, there's probably a bit more on chapter nine, a little less on chapter 10. And uh, a lot of it simple probability, some of it like you did at the end of assignment four. So the last assignment, I'm gonna to try to get that up as soon as I can. And I'm gonna to try to keep it short so that as soon as you finish that assignment, that's when classes end and you're into final exams. So you've got a lot of other things on your plate. We've got a quiz coming up on Saturday and then a final quiz the week after that. We're almost finished. Um, the course feedback survey. So remember, there's two things on the go. There's a feedback survey and there's course evaluations. I'll speak to that in a second. With the feedback survey, I tried to provoke you by asking, should we have a final exam in the course? I haven't looked at the responses, but we went from 20 to 80 in a matter of just a couple of days. So um, that's a great improvement in the response rate, but we've got over 400 in the course. So I would like to get more responses than that, especially from those of you that are doing this course online. Um, the other is the starting Monday, tomorrow, uh, the university course evaluations are gonna start and you're gonna get them for all of your courses. They're accessed through Brightspace. Um, I'm not sure exactly how the link is, but it's, using the same survey tool that I use, Qualtrics. So you can do it on your phone and that type of thing. Uh, that normally my response rate has been almost zero. I get at least one response, but never more than three out of a class. Your class is about 60 students, but um, if I get three, that would be a lot. I would ask that you please fill it out as well. Uh, just so we've got something on record, that with my class on campus, I gotta have them do it in class, get them pull their phones out and do it. And we'll spend 20 minutes doing that. So, uh, but I'd like you to please, you know, like right now, stop, do the survey, then come back to the rest of the video. That, so with them, and this is what it says on their slides, go to Brightspace, click on the link for this course, and there should be a course evaluations link that's active. It's starting tomorrow. And that, uh, just so you know, after grades are submitted, instructors get a summary of all the multiple choice questions that are on that survey. And a copy of that summary is also sent to the department chair, to the dean, to the vice president academic, and to the president. That the summaries are used in annual reports, formats reviews, contract renewal. Um, for those that are on contract, I'm not any longer, not for a long time, that your written comments only go to the instructor, not just for this course, but for every course. If the written comments are for, you're writing to the instructor, you're not telling the dean, fire this guy, um, that, uh, so any nice things, <laughs> the instructor gets, any nasty things the instructor gets, but nobody else gets to see them. Okay. Uh, they're, they're confidential there. They only get to see your scoring, you know, that type of thing. Um, they, uh, uh, 
the other instructors that are teaching this course are all new and they would definitely benefit by getting feedback uh, because they're going to need that for develop their career and everything else. Um, old guy like me um, doesn't really make a difference one way or the other, though nice things are always nice to see and suggestions are always nice to see um, that I follow a lot of the suggestions that are there. That's how this course came to be. So um, in the face-to-face -face one, I'm going to go through a few practice questions uh, that, uh, and I'll go through a few more for Wednesday's class. So I'm splitting it over two classes. So a decision tree. This is an old test question. Is a probability tree with decisions at the end of the branches? Is a picture of how Bayes' rule works? Is a pictorial way of partitioning data to concentrate yes and no cases on specific branches? Or it's a summary of all the decisions we have made. So it's not a probability tree. Okay? It, it is one that involves decisions. And actually, probability doesn't factor into it much at all. It doesn't involve Bayes' rule. It is a device we use for partitioning data and to describe the way we've done the partitioning, splitting the main data set into smaller groups. We're showing how we've done that in a picture. And that tree shows how we split and split and split. That, so the answer is C, is the right answer. So what of the following is not true about decision tree branches? Okay, with the decision trees, we got branches that take place. What are, what's not true about them? Branches represent categorical values of a variable. They can be applied to numeric variables by converting values to groups. Only works with binary variables and should reflect options that collectively lead to cleaner categorization of outcomes. Now, this is a tough one. Okay, branches, when we branch, say we branch on gender, males, females, those are both categorical values. When we branched on age, age is a numeric variable, but we split it on under 50 and over 50. So B is true as well, split into two groups. It can only work on binary variables. Not true. We've done that for convenience. It does make life a lot easier. But if I had a variable, particularly a categorical variable that was into three groups or four groups or whatever, I can split on that too. There's nothing to stop me from doing that sort of thing. So C is wrong. It's the one that's not true. D should, collective, should reflect options that collectively lead to cleaner categorization of outcomes. Purpose of a decision tree is to create groups. Okay, smaller and smaller groups because we keep splitting the data. So that of course they have to get smaller, but the groups should be cleaner, at least collectively they're cleaner than the group we started with. Sometimes when we split, we get one that's really clean and one that's dirtier than we were before. And then we try to improve that one, but it's a small group that's dirty. We've got another group that's clean. So, uh, if we do this across a whole bunch of groups, we should get lots of clean ones and a couple of dirty ones still, maybe. Ideally, we'd like them all to be clean, but collectively, they're gonna be cleaner than what we started with. We swept all the dirt into little piles. So the branching, it can stop when all groups are pure. That's all groups are clean. Uh, the size of the subgroups reaches a target minimum. The number of branches reaches a maximum or all of the above is all of the above. That my groups, if they were all clean, I wouldn't have any reason to split them any further because I, there's no dirt for me to clean up now. I don't want the subgroups to get too small. So if I have a group gets down to say 50, maybe I don't want to split it because I might get 10 and 40 and 10 is way too small to do anything with. Um, number of branches reaches a maximum. I don't want a tree that goes through 50 levels of branches because my decision rule will be if this and if this and if this and if this 50 times over, it's probably too much. It's not really improving my decisions. 
couldn't I have stopped after 20 and gotten a good answer? Do I really need to go to 50? Genie. Now, genie equals one when a group is pure, equals zero when a group is pure, is a measure of the percentage of correct predictions, or indicates that branching is desirable if it exceeds 0.5. Well, first off, genie, it's a score of how clean your group is. And if you remember, it's like a parabola. It is a parabola. It goes from zero up to a peak of 0.5, and then it drops down again. And at zero, it's when everybody is a no, and it's one when everybody is a yes. So both of those cases are pure. So it's pure when the genie score is zero. So B is right never gets up to one. Highest value is 0.5. And it says it's desirable if it exceeds 0.5. It should never exceed 0.5. It's desirable when the Gini score is slower than it was before. Okay, That if you're going from a dirty thing with a Gini of 0.4 to a cleaner group that has a Gini of 0.3, then that's a good thing. And branching is a good idea. So. If the genie scores are decreasing, then we branch. And no, it doesn't measure how many correct predictions we've made. So anyway, we'll try a few on naive bays on Wednesday. But anyway, the last, well, almost the last phase before implementation, deployment, is evaluation and evaluating this whole process you've gone through, you've gone from business understanding, data understanding, data preparation, you've done some modeling and all that sort of thing. And you're trying to find out, are you there yet? Have you done what you set out to do and done it properly? So every project you do, whether it be a data mining project or any other sort, should have evaluation. And it should be evaluated both continuously as you're going through it, and at strategic stages that the um, generally if you're doing a, a big project like a construction project for example you're trying to evaluate whether or not the project is on time and on budget and it's consistent with what the original plan was construction projects are nice that way and we have good tools for them generally of estimating where should we be at each stage along the way because we've it's very predictable generally though this year with supply chain problems it's become less certain of getting key materials or we've had labor shortages that have disrupted the a lot of construction projects but normally with a construction project we can map out where we should be at different stages in the project and how much money we should have spent how much labor we should have used and the cost of materials and that type of thing. And so those ones are really nice for going and evaluating where do you stand on the project. Projects that are hmm, less familiar, like IT implementations, they're trickier about the on time, on budget stuff. But um, uh, generally, the bigger, more complex the project is, the harder it is to do that evaluation. Data mining projects, you should have laid out a project plan of how you were going to do it and what you should have had done at different stages. And uh, they, uh, frequently with projects, we do have certain uh, important points where we stop, pause, and reflect in a detailed fashion on where we stand in the project and whether, whether or not we're going to achieve the outcomes we set for ourselves. That um, This is all part of project management, and I'm not going to get into that type of stuff with you. But it's an important area. If you get an opportunity to take a course in project management, I'd encourage you to do so. And that Everyone should do that, even if you never become a project manager. Um, that with crisp if you remember it's circular but there's backtracking and uh, the you should be tracking that sort of thing and hopefully if you're if everything's going well 
and you've taken that into account that isn't going to disrupt your project um, radically but if you do that's something you'd want to record in your lessons learned report to advise you for future projects to so that you didn't have to do as much backtracking and lessons learned is part of deployment it's when you're finished it's one of your outputs you should have the deliverables at the end is not just your solution but your guidance for the next time a project like the one you're doing is is done leave that to next week so um as i said we've gone back and forth and when you backtrack it means you must be evaluating you must be thinking about what you're doing so it is happening at the very beginning data understanding in the modeling and the data preparation we were sort of doing that and building a regression model where we had to go back and transform variables or create a new variable or do some recoding of our data so that we could fit it into the regression model so that's routine but this is sort of big evaluation to go back and look to see are you meeting the targets that you had uh, are you being is your model good enough you're so in part you're evaluating the model right? that um, so to do this your evaluation has to start actually at the beginning of the project because you have to define success at the beginning and you've got to define what success looks like because otherwise you won't know if you've reached your destination if you didn't know where you were going that you know what are the deliverables what is it you're going to give to the client or whomever you're doing it that um it's like the kids in the back seat of the car when you're going on a vacation and they're getting tired and cranky and saying are we there yet are you there yet with a very large number of projects um evaluation is something they're just in such a big hurry to get the project done that they don't think about how they're going to evaluate the outcome and they haven't really planned for it so they didn't collect benchmark data at the beginning and they didn't have success measures to know when they were there at the end they just thought oh when i build the model then i'm done but is it good enough for you uh you would be amazed how frequently that's the case um and you've got to think in advance what does success look like and how are you going to be able to measure it uh, if i was uh i don't know I've, I've seen enough projects within the university setting but also i've heard about enough that are in government healthcare a lot in the public sector i don't know the project i suspect the private private sector may be just as bad that um, they undertake major projects and they can't evaluate whether or not they've really been successful or not. So to give you an idea of how it's different, when we were looking at value estimation models before, we were looking at R squared and standard error. So we were doing evaluation as we were building the model and trying to see whether or not we were there yet. And R square is a very popular measure. If it was kept improving, then the model was getting better. But it's hard in advance to set a target as to, yes, I'm there when my R square hits 90% or 70% or some value. That we were predicting credit card balances. And <clears throat> it, um, it's tricky to be able to talk about how good the model is in terms of how much variability you've explained. Does that really mean that? So R square, I find difficult because I can't picture it and I can't sit it, <laughs> set it as a target. I could try to set standard error as a goal. I'd like to be able to estimate balances within $50 or $100 or some value. And if I've got that, then I'll be reasonably happy. I might want to have a prediction as good as possible, but I'd still like to have some numeric value of, of what would be really good. When would I be happy? And so standard error is a nice measure for many. 
it may be if you set a goal with the credit cards of, I'd like to estimate it within $25. It became apparent we'd never get there. The best we got was $83. Maybe a better model might get it down to 70, but it was pretty clear. It was gonna be hard to get it down with the data that we had, much smaller than where we were. So, um, that, um, so with, with that model, we had different ones that got more and more complicated. And here were their R squares and their standard errors. And you can observe that the model gets more and more complicated. Uh, you would be seeing with your assignment that you just did with assignment four, I think we were up to six or seven variables in the model, and we could have added a couple more, and they would make the model a little bit better, but we are grinding down to the end. We, it was going to be really difficult to get predictions that were we were measuring miles per gallon, and to get we weren't going to get below two miles per gallon as a standard error. Uh, they, um, uh, each there were several variables we hadn't added, but I tried them out and I, I got a little bit better, but not much. And so you end up deciding when do you stop? Because one of the other trade-offs is accuracy versus complexity. How complicated did you want your model to be? So would you like a model that's got 15 variables in it or six variables in it? If the 15 variable model isn't that much better, why not stick with six? Try to keep it simple. That's a subjective trade-off you've got to make. And maybe you don't make that decision till close to the end. <clears throat> and maybe you're, as you're building the model, you might give management, here are different models you could use, and here's the trade-offs with them. Someone's going to have to use the model. Maybe it's a black box, it's a computer that does all those sorts of things, and you don't care how many variables are there. It's up to you. Okay. Um, final evaluation is the client's, not yours. Now, one of the error me measures I sh probably should have covered uh, is mean percentage error. And it's a, like R square, a generic measure. So if I wanted to, instead of talking about how much of the variation I've explained, on average, how far off are my predictions and measured that in percentages? So I don't have to worry about the units. Am I measuring dollars or, or how many uh, cases of a product or uh, how many tons of goods I produced or something of that nature? Uh, that maybe getting predictions that are plus or minus 2%, plus or minus 10%, 30%, depending upon the industry. Um, it varies that way. With years ago, when I used to predict enrollments for revenue purposes for the university, uh, getting it within 2% was viewed as being really, really good. But 2% added up to a million dollars. That's, that's a lot of money that you ended up with a million dollars short, shortfall or a million dollar surplus. That was a big deal. But that was what 2% represented. The um, in other instances, in retail, getting a prediction that's within 20 or 30 percent may be seen as being relatively good because it's really difficult coming into the Christmas season and that big sale season as to how many units you're going to sell. And next year, you won't, you'll be selling a different version. So it's not like you just carry it forward. It's, you sell off your excess. That's why all the big sales you'll see is because it's a seasonal product and often we can't predict closer than 20 to 30 percent that would be seen as good it varies as to what is precise okay and i mentioned last time about overfitting you've got to be careful with your model that whether or not the predictions that are coming out of it are valid are they correct because you fit it to a training set of data so it's like building something in the lab and you take it out of the lab, is it still gonna work in the real world? And uh, it's one of the problems we run into is that we overfit our models, uh, that the labs are, 
on the training data we've used to build the model, the performance is always better than what you'll see in practice. So how do you deal with that? That I made mention last time about what it looks like, but this overfitting, I'm not gonna go through that again. What we do about it is to have two data sets. Take your original data set of say a thousand observations and set aside 200 observations for testing later. Build your model on 800. 800 hopefully is enough. And having that extra 200 isn't gonna make your model that much better during the training period. Build it on the 800 and have that 200 set aside. And now go and apply the model on the 200 and see how it behaves. You'll find it behaves a little, not as well as on the training data set, but hopefully it should be very similar. If it's a lot worse, then you've had a problem of overfitting. You've trained your data, your model too much on the data. If it's a good model, it should perform almost as good on that test data set that you've used for evaluation. You gotta make sure it's the, an appropriate data set to use. Uh, if it was time series data, and it was looking at what's happened over 800 days, over two and a half years or something, and you used you know, the first, um, uh, or you've, you've, you've got a thousand observations, you've got, you got three years of data, and you've taken two and a half years of data to train it, and the last half year to apply it, okay, you're using the past to predict the future, That's, that might actually work. But if you took a random sample across the 1,000 days of 800, so a little bit from the beginning, the middle, the end, it actually won't work as well in the future. You'll test it on those 200, but they're 200 in the middle. And with time series data, no, that's not fair because you've seen observations earlier and later than that one that you've got in your training data. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into picking the right holdout sample value. It's beyond the scope of what we're doing, but as I said, we can do it and we can get a good insight on what the future will look like. They should warn you that, you know, why is it always better on the training data set? Remember, we minimize the errors. So we, we use least squares, it min minimize the mean squared error. And so it's the best we could possibly do on the training data. And so on any other data set, it's going to not perform quite as well because it's not been optimized to it. The other warning is it has to do with the future. And uh, we've seen, uh, we thought we were, it was challenging predicting the future as we went through COVID. And then Russia invaded Ukraine and that disrupted everything in terms of the world economy uh, further. So that supply chains that were problematic during COVID became even worse after the invasion of Ukraine, um, changing oil prices, just everything messed up. These future events may happen and disrupt your model so that what looked like a great model, now you're gonna have to start all over again until your environment stabilizes again and you can retune your model to fit the new environment. We're having trouble still doing that for a lot of things because of, uh, we're trying to find our way now that we're into a new future. Now classification models, uh, we've alluded to how do we do that, but we it's quite different, okay? In, classification, you're right or you're wrong, that we're gonna look at classification where we're only into two groups and still our classification into the two groups are either correct or incorrect. If you're classifying things into three groups, still your classification is right or wrong, but it may look a little different. That, so if we were looking at a customer renewing their car insurance, we're gonna make a prediction that a customer is gonna renew or they're not gonna renew. And the truth is they're either gonna renew or not renew. But truth and prediction are different things. 
and we can summarize those outcomes in what we call a confusion matrix. Okay, so we've got on the top the truth that they renewed their insurance or they did not renew their insurance, and the rows represent our predictions. Did they predict that they're going to renew, or did we predict they're not going to renew? And we'll get some correct predictions. We're going to predict they renew and they actually did. Good stuff. Or that we're going to predict they're not going to renew and they didn't renew. That's again a correct prediction. I've called them positives and negatives. This is some of the jargon that you'll encounter. And so we've categorized one outcome as being a positive outcome and one outcome as being a negative outcome. Okay. I've said renewing their insurance is positive, not renewing is negative. Those are arbitrary. You can flip it the other way around. But once you do, then it, it affects some of the things we're going to get to next. So a predicting someone's going to renew, and they do, we call a true positive. And predicting they're not going to renew, and they don't renew, is called a true negative. Again, the right prediction. But we can get a false positive. We predicted they're going to renew, and they don't. And you hear a false positive, like in a test for COVID or for cancer, came back as a positive test result, but actually they didn't have cancer. That they call a false positive. And we get also false negatives. The test that the test came back negative, so we predicted that they didn't have cancer, but actually they did. That's called a false negative. So. Um, bit of this jargon and it's hard to wrap your head around it's easy to get confused so watch out but I get confused on this all the time and jargon that's used so suppose I've got a thousand customers that I've got a model that uh, is predicted 700 of them are going to renew that in fact only 650 renewed and they weren't exactly the same 650 as the ones I predicted that I predicted 700 would, re, would renew and 300 would not. And it turned out 600 of mine that I predicted would renew did, but 100 of the ones that I predicted didn't. So remember the columns are the truth. And the 300 that didn't renew, well, 250 of them I predicted correctly. But 50 that didn't renew, or that 50 of the ones that I predicted would renew didn't. Confused? In total, 650 renewed, 350 didn't. Uh, uh, uh. How accurate were my predictions? Well, the accuracy we'd say is 85% because of my true positives. My predicted they would renew, and they did. It was 600 and 250 I predicted would not renew, and they didn't. And so I get a total of 85%. Think of it as a true-false test. So you've got 1,000 questions on the test, of which 650 of them, the right answer is true, and 350 of them, the answer is false. The correct answer is false. And you went and took the test, and of the ones that were supposed to be true, you guessed 600 of them correctly, but 50 of them you guessed incorrectly. You marked them as false when they were actually true. And of the 350 that were false, well, 250 of them, you were right. You, you guessed false as well. But 100 of them, you guessed were true, and they were actually false. What's your total grade on the test? You get 850 correct, so 85% is your grade on the test. Okay. That now with a true false test, it just you're just scored on how many you got right, how many you got wrong. That guessing a one that's true and it is true is the same as guessing one that's false and it is false. Making a mistake, both of your mistakes are the same. 
But what about cases where um, the consequences aren't all the same? If you predicted a customer wasn't going to renew, and so you didn't do anything with them uh, that I've lost that customer. Should you have? That would you have done something to try to entice them? Would you make some sort of offer to them? And if they did renew, hmm, that maybe you were able to change their behavior. What are the consequences? Is there a payoff? Is there a loss? If you incorrectly assumed a customer is going to renew their insurance and thought, oh, this one's safe. I don't need to worry about them. And they change their mind. Maybe you should have done something to help change their mind. Is there, was there a consequence to that? That when we're looking at accuracy, we treat everything as being the same. Any mistake we make, anything that we get correct is the same. But that's not always the case. Some of the things we make money, some we lose money. So maybe we want to look at it in a different fashion. So let's look at all of the positives, all the people that are going to renew their insurance. Okay? There were 650 who were going to renew their insurance. How many of them did you get correct? So of the renewals, how many did you predict correctly? Well, you predicted 600 of them. So 92% you predicted correctly. So you got the, it's the number of true positives you've got, the number of correct positive predictions, that's true positives, divided by the number of positives, the number that renewed in this case. So it's the same as a probability statement, probability predict would renew, given that these ones will renew. Okay, out of all those that renewed, what proportion did you pick correctly? So it looks like we got most of the renewals. We got 92% of them. That sounded pretty good. What about those that didn't renew? Did I predict them quite well? It's called specificity. I have trouble pronouncing that. So of all those that didn't renew, the 350 that didn't renew, did you identify them all correctly? No. I only identified 250 of them. 100 of them I missed. I thought they were going to renew and I didn't do anything about them. Okay. That uh, these ones were maybe once opportunities lost. So these are of all of the negatives. So I'm going to look at the number of true negatives divided by the number of negatives. Among all those that are negative, that stuff that's over here on the right, among all of those ones, how many did you predict correctly? Among all those that didn't renew, how many did you identify? 71%, not very good. I missed almost 30%, 29% of them. So I'm not doing very good with that group, whereas I did very well with the other one. That, so we're, predict, we're better at predicting renewals non-renewals. We're always better at one than the other. We're always better at predicting one outcome than the other outcome. And the accuracy is a number that's in between the two. The 85% is sort of an average of these two. But which one is sort of the best one to use? And is 85% really that good? That you may need a benchmark to evaluate that. So even if you're focusing just on accuracy, is 65% high level of accuracy? Is 85%. Well, if you had no model at all, okay, you didn't know anything about the customer, so I couldn't build a model. From historical data, 650 out of 1,000 customers renew their insurance. So if you picked a random customer, are they going to renew? I guess would be yes, because 65% of them do. 65% okay? of them renew, so I will guess everybody's going to renew. <laughs> I have no way to identify who might not. 
So that's my model. I'm going to predict everybody's going to renew. So what happens here? All 1,000, I think, are going to renew. And of course, I get a catch. All 650 that do. And I'm going to miss everybody that doesn't renew because I predicted everybody would renew. Does that make any sense? So it's a funny looking confusion matrix because it's just, I predicted everybody will renew. So not renew, it's all zeros. So my accuracy is 65%. 650 out of 1,000, I got right. My sensitivity of those that renew, did I, how many of them did I capture? Out of the 650, I got every one of them. So it's, it's perfect. But my specificity of those that didn't renew, how many of them did I catch? None of them. Zero out of 350. <laughs> so my accuracy is 65. But sensitivity, how good am I with those that renew? Perfect. 100%. Specificity, those that don't renew? I'm awful. It's zero. So when Evaluating is 85% good. I've got to have some benchmark and that it isn't quite flipping a coin. It isn't 50-50 because more of them renew than don't. It's 65% is your baseline. I've got to do at least 65%. That's better than nothing. Okay? Um, accuracy with this last one hides the big imbalance between sensitivity and specificity. I said that Accuracy is, in a sense, an average, but it really doesn't give you a sense of what you're averaging, how far you are on the upside and on the downside. Here's another one. What if I'm looking at, in particular, looking at my mistakes, and particularly when looking for something that's uncommon, if I'm looking for fraud, for example, that most transactions shouldn't be fraudulent, that most transactions should be valid. So let's suppose out of 100,000 transactions, 99% are valid that are good, and 1% are fraud that are bad. And I'm using a model to go and try to screen these transactions based upon customer history. And so you go to use your credit card and sort of waits and waits and waits. You know, you put in your PIN number or whatever, or you've used TAP. And then it comes back and say approved, or it comes back and says declined or rejected. And it's not perfect. That the in this model, it uh, among the valid ones, it catches ninety eight thousand out of the ninety nine thousand, uh, but misses. It ends up rejecting a few, and among the fraudulent ones it seems to catch 800 out of the 1,000. So no, notice how I'm looking at percentage of column total. So this sensitivity here, it's going to be 98 is out of 99,000 is how many of the valid ones of the positives I've been able to capture. That sensitivity, specificity is on the bad ones, on the negative things, how many of them were you able to catch? 800 out of 1,000. So oh, my specificity is going to be 80% by the looks of things. And my accuracy would be close to 99%. Let's see. I think I do the calculations next. There we are. So the accuracy is almost 99%. Sensitivity is about 99%. And the specificity is 80%. Okay, so it works most of the time, but it makes some mistakes, particularly in terms of detecting fraud. I'm not as good at detecting fraud as I am at detecting valid transactions. But the fraud doesn't happen often, so they're harder to detect. So what about the mistakes you make, and are they important? Well, the first one we're going to look at is called the false omission rate. Okay, So these in this one is I'm going to look at how many negatives that I had 
that I predicted. And if you think of that table, how many, I'm gonna look at the rows. I'm gonna look at my predictions. So the columns represented the different transactions, the different customers, and how many were good, how many were bad, how many of the good guys I caught, how many of the bad guys I caught, okay? Let's look at the decision you make. Isn't that the same? No, it's not. I'm looking across at the rows. Suppose I reject your transaction. Is it really bad? Is it re could it be good? So I've got 1,790 that I've rejected. And how many did I reject incorrectly? 990, 55%. So of the ones I rejected, 55% were actually valid. There was nothing wrong with them. That's what TD did to me when I was in Bermuda. They rejected my credit card thinking it was fraudulent. And I got very angry. <laughs> I was very embarrassed trying to pay a hotel bill with a card they were rejecting saying they thought it was fraudulent. So if that was happening frequently, can you imagine being the you know, there's the 1-800 number on the back of the card. I phoned that, I phoned TD. What the hell are you doing here? And I was very upset. Um, I'd hate to be the poor customer service agent on the other end and have to listen to this one. And if it's frequent, look, 55% of the rejects were actually valid. I wouldn't want to be that, have that job. Um, what about the other way around? The ones that you predicted were valid. They were predicted they would be positive, but turned out to be bad. You approved a fraudulent transaction, okay? That among the ones you approved, what percentage were actually fraudulent? Well, ah, good news here, that you approved 98,210 transactions and 200 of them were fraudulent. It's about 0.2%. Now, initially, 1% of all transactions were fraudulent. One in, a, um, one in 100. Now you've got it down to two in 1,000. One in 500. So you've cleaned up an awful lot of the fraud. There's a little bit that's still slipping through, but it still makes that mistake. And yeah, they, uh, TD got me on that one too in Jamaica, where it approved a bunch of transactions that uh, were actually fraudulent. <laughs> they make those mistakes, okay? It happens that what's the impact of those and what's the trade-off between the two? So this is frustrating that um, accuracy seemed like a really nice measure to use. Here's one with credit cards. It's right 99% of the time, that's the accuracy. It's catching the good guys, what was it, 92% of the time, and uh, something like 98% of the time, 99% of the time. It was approving the valid transactions, and it was catching the fraudulent ones 80% of the time. That the false omission rate, I think it was, or false, what did I have here? These false ones are the false discovery rate of um, the, that you thought it was a good transaction and was actually bad. You approved it, but it was actually fraudulent. It's really small. It's only one in 500. It's really, really good. But your false omission rate, the ones that you've rejected, 55% of them are actually good. This is complicated that we've got so many different metrics. And actually, there are other metrics that are used as well that uh, it's really hard on the brain. How do I make all the trade-offs? Which one should I focus on? Which one's most important? It's difficult. It's complicated. Um, that So just before I close this, because I'm going to give you some hope in the next class as to what we do, remind you that a lot of this confusion, you probably saw it before when we were dealing with pivot tables and percentage of row total versus percentage of column total, which one should we use? Or 
last the week before when we were doing probability and probability of a given b versus b given a and telling you how people make mistakes they get things backwards that's the same way with all these different performance measures they're flipping around are you looking at the columns that was sensitivity and specificity and that's how many of the good guys do you get how many of the bad guys did you detect or are you looking at your decisions that's the rows and how many of them are you getting right or wrong okay so as i said sensitivity that's percentage of column total or specificity percentage of column total false omission rate it's flipping that the other way around in terms of valid and fraud we're moving from one side to the other side like a and b flipping them around when we're looking at decisions those are generally our rows and are we looking at how often are we making the right decision or the wrong decision those ones are percentage of row total it's not simple that and we got mixed up you know with the rapid test and the, the mammogram uh test both look to be really, really accurate tests. Those ones we are looking at sensitivity and specificity rates, and those look really, really good. That it almost always identified when you had cancer, when you had uh, COVID, if you had it, and if you didn't have it, it almost always said you don't have it. Both cases really, really good. But when we looked at the diagnoses, the decisions that were made we discovered mm, there are a lot of mistakes being made, that it's flipping these around. And if you get confused, you're not alone. A lot of good company. You got to keep working at it. It's my only thing I can advise on that. It's, it's you have to think carefully. Uh, don't jump to conclusions. Do the question slowly. <laughs> or when you're given probabilities that Try to recognize is this is conditional probability, and if it is, then think about uh, how many of this or that or what's being measured here. Be cautious. Don't jump to conclusions. So, if you get around all of this stuff, well, actually, there there is a way. If it's a repetitive decision, then there's some real hope that's there. That when we're looking at we're not looking at one credit card customer. We're looking at millions of transactions every day. And we're making decisions, 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 decisions. Don't obsess over the individual. Maybe we should look on average, how are we doing? And maybe there's a different way we can approach this. That's for next class. That's it. We're at an end. So I've got to turn you off. <laughs>